Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time. We are excited to um, share information on some of the uh, new workflows and use cases for how you can use your Esri and Autodesk tools today and how this can help uh, hopefully provide some improvements in your, in your workflows. So um, the pre presenters today uh, will include myself. So I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Brockwell IT Consulting. I've worked in the industry for uh, over 15 years. I think that time has expanded now. So um, we also have Stephen Brockwell. Stephen is the uh, President and Founder of Brockwell IT Consulting and has over 30 years of experience working in the industry, GIS, CAD, uh, database architecture. And we also have Richard Horrocks as well. So Richard is a senior consultant for Brockwell IT Consulting as well. And he uh, helps our customers solve real business problems. So um, we're excited to, to share with you um, some of this content today. And so, you know, one of the things Steve and myself and Richard all have in common is uh, in, our, in our past lives, we all worked at Autodesk. Uh, so we do have a great deal of experience working with the Autodesk tools, um, not only on the CAD side, but also working with Esri and the Esri tools on the GIS, uh, the GIS applications in the GIS industry. So we're thrilled to see the partnership between Esri and Autodesk sort of coming together and having these uh, leaders in GIS and BIM technology working to improve solutions for our customers. So, the agenda today um, is uh, we're going to do some quick introductions, so I'll, I'll start that off, talk uh, briefly about some of the industry challenges and business pains, and then Stephen and Richard are really going to get into the meat of the discussion, talking about the BIM and GIS opportunity, and we're going to focus on some specific use cases, some customer data, customer workflows that hopefully you can then take away and, and apply to your own jobs and in your own uh, environment. Uh, we'll talk about key takeaways and what's next. <clears throat> okay, yeah, so we're going to kick things off with a poll. Um, so just to get a better sense of who uh, is on the line and uh, some of the different applications you're using. So hopefully everybody's seen the poll pop up in your window. And if you can just go ahead and, and fill, um, fill some uh, content in there, that would be great. I'll give it a, a few seconds. Okay. Excellent. We capture that, Jessica. Yeah, everything looks great. So thank you guys so much okay. for participating. All right, so we'll go into who we are. So um, I, we've probably worked with a number of you on the phone, on the, oh, sorry, on the webinar. For those of you who we haven't worked with, I just wanted to do a quick introduction. So, um, you know, our team, we provide consulting, software development, and expertise focused around BIM GIS integration all across North America. So we're head office in Texas. We also are head office in Ottawa. And uh, Jessica was uh, kind enough to put a picture of Vancouver there. That's where I'm located. Uh, we focus on the AET industry in general. Um, you know, we've worked a lot uh, with utilities, government, uh, transportation, infrastructure customers, uh, and so on. So, um, yeah, I was pleased to, uh, to work with all these different groups. Um, so our partners are really the core of our business. Uh, we have three key partnerships. Um, today we're focusing on our partnerships with Esri and Autodesk. And, you know, we're very privileged to be able to work with such great companies um, to help support the integration and software development between the applications that many of you are using. Uh, we've been a developer partner and a business partner for Esri for a number of years. Uh, as well with Autodesk, we are helping to do the integration with Autodesk and ArcGIS technology, um, and we've been working with their team for, for a long, long time. 
The other partnership I'll mention just briefly, although we're not focusing on this today, you will see some of the technology incorporated in some of these specific use cases uh, is Cyclomedia. So Cyclomedia is a newer technology in North America. Uh, the company, Cyclomedia does uh, mobile image capture and LIDAR capture. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's a great tool and we really see um, this technology adding value across the project life cycle and being, being an integral part of the story. And, and Stephen and Richard will point that out as we're going through today. So, you know, industry challenges. There are a number of industry challenges that, you know, many of you on this call are trying to address. And I'm sure, you know, these are familiar to, um, to everyone, whether it be aging infrastructure, you know, bridges falling down, urbanization, um, you know, dealing with extreme weather events. Uh, you know, my colleagues in Canada were facing major flooding just in the last week. And Technology and innovation are really critical to providing solutions to these problems. As we know, you know, the big push for smart cities, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, a lot of programs out there driving innovation to help address and tackle some of these problems. And so in order to do that, you know, one of the things that needs to happen is also to use technology to address the smaller problems, right? The business pains that you face in your current roles. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on today. You know, some of the business pains that I know are familiar to everyone, um, you know, data silos, right? Quite often there's limited access to data at the beginning of a project. It takes a lot of time to be able to pull all this information together and throughout the engineering process, right? And this inefficiency often leads to low data confidence, which often results in duplication, uh, rework, you know, uh, increased costs. We also uh, face incomplete information quite often, right? Getting as-built design data back into the GIS has been a problem for many of our customers forever, right? Having the correct documentation for ongoing maintenance and operations. And, uh, you know, I've mentioned BIM, building inform information modeling, and that's going to be part of our discussion and what you're going to see today. You know, many uh, countries and agencies and organizations are moving to BIM for their design and construction processes. There's huge benefits to doing that. And leveraging the full capabilities of GIS functionality and having that ability to bring that into your, into your process can improve that even more. And I hope that's what um, we're going to convey today with some of these use cases and some of these examples, and that you'll be able to take that away and, and, um, and use that yourself. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Stephen. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so what you see here is a kind of um, ideal architecture for how things would work in you know, across the life cycle of infrastructure uh, from the planning side, when you're dealing with stakeholders and, you know, ArcGIS has story maps, which are a fantastic way to convey that kind of information visually uh, and in a narrative form through the design process with Civil 3D or InfoWorks, uh, with construction, Revit, uh, both on the building and actually increasingly on the horizontal uh, infrastructure side, but the full 3D modeling and uh, construction uh, drawing uh, construction for that. And then finally, being able to, once the asset's constructed, do things with it, visualize it, um, analyze the performance of it, perhaps uh, look for issues that might be coming up. All of those applications, web applications, desktop applications for design, depend on right now this integration services layer that is uh, fundamentally part of ArcGIS uh, portal and online technology, where you're integrating data from ArcGIS Geo databases, ArcGIS Online. Um, hopefully, in the future, we'll be starting to integrate, and you know, with the, the connector, you'll be able to do some of this. The Internet of Things uh, data from Collector, which we'll actually be showing today. Point cloud data from various different sources, both uh, aerial, terrestrial, and so on. And then also the document management side of things, uh, where we have integration between um, the operational view of assets uh, for construction and uh, the geospatial view for the analysis and being able to do these things as seamlessly as possible uh, from an end user perspective. One of the things I want to emphasize here is uh, the 
file is disappearing as a means of data integration between these products. And that is an excellent thing for absolutely everyone. Go ahead. Um, so the data we're seeing today is based on a, a project we've been doing with the city of Kingston, which has primarily been started with uh, Cyclomedia uh, data collection, um, which you see a little bit of an image of there, the panoramic uh, pho photograph, plus the LIDAR data behind it so that you can do 3D measurements. But in conversations with the city of Kingston, I noticed Jordan was on the phone uh, or on the call. Um, we started to sort of see some patterns that were really characteristic of a kind of model city. I mean, Kingston's uh, about 150, 200,000 people in um, central Ontario, on Lake Ontario. And um, they have, you know, their own infrastructure. They manage their own electrical grid. They manage their own water infrastructure. And they have, you know, large construction projects. And they've done a fantastic job of embracing both platforms. So they have a lot of Autodesk products and they have a lot of ArcGIS products. And um, what we're looking forward to, and this is part of what, you know, with some of the products you're going to see today have just been released, but is more seamless interaction between all of these products to facilitate improved uh, workflows. So let's start off with uh, something that is really completely uh, Kingston's work. It's a fantastic idea for how to visualize zoning compliance with uh, 3D modeling on the ArcGIS online and pro side. So um, what this is an old zoning map that, um, you know, the old sort of zoning, you know, procedures would have been very manual, very kind of site specific. And uh, to know whether a building is going to comply or not would not necessarily be something you could easily visualize and communicate with stakeholders. Now, as we'll see in a second here, Richard will take over and he'll show you a little demo in ArcGIS Pro of how uh, the city of Kingston has changed the way they do that. Yeah, it's uh, in this, um, you can see here in ArcGIS Pro where I'm, I'm navigating to my Revit model that I place in one particular place in, in downtown. And, and what I just uh, turn on is a 3D model of, of, of the zone. In it, this, this shell represents the maximum level of construction that they can do in that area. If their building doesn't fit in that shell, means that it's not compliant to the zoning code. So in this case, you can see that there is a, a little a rotation of the building and, a, and an extension in the south. So, so this needs to be addressed and fixed to ensure that uh, it's complying with the zoning. For that I was muted for a second. So that's just one very simple example of how starting from the RGIS side, you've got you know the ability to start doing zoning and planning activities. And then okay, you're going to eventually put that data into a design tool. It would be really nice if I could just grab the data I needed from my project without having to go to the file system, without sending emails. I'd like to be able to self-serve myself. I'd like to be able to search for data that I know is related to this project that has tags that tell me, for example, that it's been approved, that it's the uh, most recent data set, and it's got a certain set of properties that are going to help me make a design that I don't have to go back and forth and exchange and, you know, redo work because I've got out-of-date information. So one other thing I should mention here is, of course, there is still an offer for Autodesk customers um, to be able to get uh, the ArcGIS um, platform for this uh, for a period of time, up to 12 months, I think, from the time you sign up. And um, in detail, at some other point, we can talk about, in some of the workshops we're going to be giving over the next uh, coming months, how you can really easily just start working with ArcGIS Online, even if you're an Autodesk customer that is not familiar with it. Um, because the online platform is so incredibly easy to use from an ESRI perspective that I think you'll start to see the power right away um, just based on what we're going to show you here. So go ahead. Um, so one of the things that we've done with the connector, uh, Autodesk connector for ArcGIS is allow you to access any GIS resource on the ArcGIS online or on your own uh, on-premise portal um, graphically without having to exchange files, it's always by reference. So you're always referring to the service reference, not to a file that you copy down and preserve. So you can share the results of your engineering workflows with uh, GIS users as well. 
and you can leverage the value of point cloud data for the design and planning process. So let's have a look at how that might work. So here what we have is uh, my InfraWorks model from one area of downtown Kingston. I'm zooming in and what I would like to have here is uh, connecting to RGIS online, my site, and bring a, a couple layer from there. Uh, I will bring the water and sewer network that I have in, in one of my maps. Uh, there's two, these are two layers that are in 2D. Here you can see how I'm connected and you can see the, the viewport, you know, that represents the extension of my model in InfraWorks that is, is graphic in the map. So uh, that is the area that I will, will be covered. And here I see the available layers from the map that I select. So here I'm, I, I'm selecting the, the wastewater manholes and, and the pipes, and I define a category to place it inside the infra walls because I need to, to display a standard symbology. In here, now it's loading. The two layers are loading. And now what I need, I need to do is uh, correct the style because now they, are placing, they were placed on top of the floor I want to push them back three meters underneath the ground and extend the manhole as a, a two, two, four meters. So in this case, I pick the color and I put a, a negative a height of minus three. So that push it down, down to the ground. And, and now, now, you know, if yes. I may, Richard, just add to that, the elevation could be coming from an attribute because you don't only just pull in the graphic data here, you have access to all of the ArcGIS attributes um, that were in the, uh, you know, the ArcGIS data model that you've got up there. So, yeah, exactly. So specify those dynamically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in this case, now you can see the, the manholes on top of the street. But if I go underneath the floor, you will see the network beautiful display. And this coming from the 2D uh, layer uh, in ArcGIS Online. Excellent. Yeah. All right, so now we have, you know, the ability to bring in any ArcGIS data really from, uh, you know, our ArcGIS Online or Portal and pull it into InfoWorks. What if I want to change some of that data? So what if I found that um, either a manhole or a pole or something like that has been mislocated? Well, I can use ArcGIS Collector as part of my workflow and in fact integrate those field changes on the fly with InfoWorks as Richard is going to show you now. So here I'm connecting to my RGIS online map and I will be working with Paul. So I just turn it on and I navigate close by to an area that uh, there's no Paul. Then I jump into RG and InfraWorks, the same extension, the same model, and I zoom into the same area where I don't have a uh, Paul. Now I'm connecting to RGIS online to the same map that I showed you before. So I will bring the, all those poles in, into my uh, InfraWorks model. So here I look in, in my content, selecting the map again, and defining the, the category for the poles that will be displayed in, in my InfraWorks model. It's okay, Let's wait for a second, a few seconds. So they are rendered here. And by default, uh, they are showing a, a hydrant, but then I need to change that uh, style and uh, with, with the configuration palette. So in here, I go to the, to the libraries, to the style libraries. I select one of the, the poll, and then when I press OK, they will be rendered as a poll, as you can see here. And you can see that I, I, still, I can access to those uh, attributes in ArcGIS Online. Now here, I just run the the collector for RGIS. I'm connecting exactly to the same map. So in this case, I want to create a poll. This could be in your phone, but I have it in your, my laptop now. So what I did is I just click in one of the existing polls just to copy the attributes, just to save me time. I don't have to type everything. So I, I, I review the attributes and I place the new polls in the, in the map. And then I, I, create, I, I submit it in, in the uh, and save it. Now I, I'm back in RGIS Online, where my poll was placed very quickly. And here in InfraWorks, if I refresh my layer, the, the, poll, the new poll will be there. 
And the only thing that I need is just refresh. So, so you can see that it could be in different locations, different tools connecting to the same data. And just with a simple refresh, the data will become available to me. So here is the poll. And now what I am doing is moving this poll inside InfraWorks to another place. So you can see I just put it in the other side of the street. And then I save back the, the change. And then I go back to RGLS Online, and, and the, the poll has been put it in the last position that I put it inside InfraWorks. So this, all the circle is complete in this sense. You know, I started with the collector for RGIS, and, and, and then I see it reflected in RGIS Online, later in InfraWorks. I modified in InfraWorks, and then it's, uh, it's, it's refreshed in RGIS Online again. I cannot emphasize, I think, enough how, you know, this is important, uh, not only for the current releases of the products, but for the future. This is a really time-saving way of interacting with your data from an engineering perspective. It doesn't mean you have to always push those changes back to ArcGIS, but it does mean you can when it's appropriate. It does mean that if you're doing a design and there's a change in the field, you can pull in those conditions and uh, do design with more up-to-date data. And just finding the data as easily as we do with the, the, Arc, you know, the Autodesk connector for ArcGIS, it changes the way that um, data is exchanged uh, between departments and between stakeholders. Because it, it's all driven out of the organizational you know, sharing model of uh, RGS online, so you can share it with external stakeholders. It all depends on how you've organized your site, who has permissions to do what, and um, it's a really exciting uh, innovation, I think, and the, it shows the partnership really coming to fruition. So the other thing we wanted to talk about, we're just really briefly introducing some of the Cyclomedia concepts, but behind a lot of this, you're building complex data models and complex engineering drawings and uh, in InfraWorks and Civil 3D. And what we wanted to focus on was how all of this works together. So in this model, we built this from a really large um, collection of point clouds that were uh, you know, uh, scanned by Cyclomedia. We've also got ArcGIS data here that we've uh, pulled in, and we're gonna do some design and some exports in different ways. Richard, are you you muted? Yeah, sorry, I wasn't mute. So mm -hmm. it's um, yeah, this is InfraWorks model. I have all the point cloud that we extract from the Cyclomedia project, and here we upload them and run the classification tool, where we can extract points and uh, and line. In this case, I'm showing how to do the linear extraction from the center line segment of the existing street. And when you run the old classification tool, it's created a surface based on those points. So, so the, this tool is, is smart enough just when you define a segment and if all the conditions are, are put in together, it continues automatically to, to the end of the street. So I just define a segment, let it do uh, its job. And you can see that in, in this case, and for the center line and for the, the, the bottom of the curb, it has been created automatically. Also, I'm not doing the top of the curb you know, because the surface and, and, and it's, it's smart enough and it will go to the end of the street. Sometimes you will find situation that you have a ramp or there's a car there. And I will show you in the next step how to correct that. Because uh, you can create, uh, you can define the cross sections and navigate through them and, and, and fix a, any problem that has been uh, found. So in this case, I'm creating a new a line that define a, a, another line. And now what I will do is I, I click in the center line and I access to the cross section. And here you can see in different color the same time of line that I create. The blue is the, is the, the top of the curve, the, the orange is the center line. And then I can start navigating through the cross section and you can do corrections in the cross section. For example, if I click there, you can see that that particular point is in edit mode. So I can move it up and down to place it in the right place. So, and I got, you can define the, how far the, 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 cross, uh, the different cross sections are. So this is very, uh, the, you can define many parameters. In this case, I'm doing 
fairly quick, you know, for for the demonstration. But I can go to the end of the street and, and look like there's no problems. So once that I, I finished creating those and validating the cross section, I, I want to define the the transfer lines, and you will see that uh, they are generated. So you can see clear when I remove the point cloud and just the surface. So I have all this, and this is a matter of say, a, a few seconds, so a, a few minutes, per, uh, sorry. And so, but it's fairly quick to do it, you know, and, and you have all the tools to edit and, and, and fix them if, if you need to correct something. So in here, I, I bring to Civil 3D the lines that I create just as a reference to bring my point clouds. When you export from InfraWorld, you can bring your point clouds. In this case, I brought it as a recut files, but you can bring it as a thin surface directly from InfraWorld. Civil has those tools. So I upload this point cloud. So now I'm cropping it to the area that I was working, where those lines are. So I'm, get rid I'm getting rid of the exit point. And, and now with the small point cloud that I have, I will create a thin surface, a, a thin surface uh, from the point cloud. So now that I create it, you can see, just I'll click there, just in a sec. Uh, it's it's uh, processing, yeah, it's there. And then I will change the style just to see the, the, the triangle that has been generating in the thin surface. Now I have it this, and, and and what I will do now, I want to put this surface in the in the BIM 360, in the doc 360 folder for my project. So everybody will have access. So there's a tool here in Civil that you can use that is a published to published surface. That what it does is using the Autodesk connector for BIM 360. It just uh, publish the surface. If you have anything else in this uh, drawing files, it will just publish the surface. No? So, and, and, and then when you click, okay, it will be uploaded and will become right away available for you. So here is the model, the DWG. So I, I click in the, in the file to, to see it. And this is the, the surface that I just create in Civil 3D with the information that I got initially from InfraWorks. Now that I have this file in, 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 in Docs 360, I run the application uh, GeoBeam, where I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm connected to RGIS Online and, and, and Beam 360. In here, I, I am able to select the file and link it to one of the elements in the GIS, in this case, the central line segment from my 2D layer. Then I click it and, 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 will, and will be linked uh, permanently. And here, I, when I click in, in the left side, I, I will see the, the, the files in 2 or 3D as I, I see it. You can see it now. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. So <clears throat> that particular use case and, you know, the interface between InfoWorks and Civil 3D, it's getting better all the time. But the key thing is here, we started from that geospatial perspective. We collected some data, we built an InfraWorks model that used it, we started to do some preliminary design. We said, okay, well, let's get that point cloud exported to InfraWorks and generate a surface for that particular um, area that we're looking at. But in InfraWorks, there's another way to do this through the IMX model exchange when you're actually doing some, you know, finger painting, as I like to call it, design of roads. So you're adding new road segments, component roads, to your model and uh, you're doing some design of those and you'd like to export those to Civil 3D, uh, the recommended approach is to use the IMX or the model directly. And Richard's gonna show you how that works uh, as well because you have choices here. Yeah, in a similar way, I go here where I create my center line segment from the linear destruction and I want to create a, a design road. So I, I uh, launch the tools. So I create a two lane uh, design road and from the based on the center line that I generate. So you can see that it's just a, a couple of clicks. It creates a design, design road that all the elements that I need to continue my design in Civil 3D. So now that I, I generate in this way, I will export it using the, the tools uh, to the, well here, sorry, you can see the profile view. It's very similar that you can see, you, the one that you have in Civil. And now I export it to IMX. So you use all these tools and 
and define a, a polygon, you know, just for the street that I just create. And the, those boundaries. And then you just wait a, a couple of minutes until it's done. You know, save it in, define the, the, where you want to locate the file. Yeah, it's done. So I just doing a, a last pan there. And now I go to Civil 3D in the next video. So I upload the, the, the file, the new file that I generate. And you can see, you see it has all the symbology and style that Civil 3D for road designing. Yeah, this including a, the Yeah, yeah, exactly. This, this is a very, yeah. Yeah, very basic one, but but uh, but you can define the complexity that you need. You know? And from here, I, I publish it to uh, Doc360 or Bin 360 And you can see it in my folder of my pro in the folder of my project. So it's in the cloud now. So now in the similar way that I showed before, I can link this a file in the cloud in the Bing 360 to one of my features in, in, in my map in RGIS online. So then I can change the view, I can see the 3D, and then you can see the surface and the and that other, and the alignment that was created there in Civil 3D. Now these are really simple, you know, for the time, I mean, obviously, you know, civil engineering is much tougher than this, but we're just trying to show the concepts of how the data flows from the preliminary kind of analysis stage, data collection through to the engineering side, and then the more construction management and operational side with GIS participating throughout the entire uh, life cycle seamlessly and that is uh, really kind of a, the revolution we're talking about here from uh, an integration point of view and the value of the partnership that Esri and Autodesk are uh, bringing to the table. So you know this is what we're going to finish up with here so now we've done a bunch of different things we've uh, done some work with uh, this sort of uh, street we've done some grading we've done some you know all of this some pipes and poles and these kinds of things all of this to bring infrastructure to bear on a new building uh, that we constructed. And the sort of integration between Autodesk and Esri does not stop at the, uh, just the ArcGIS connector level. So Esri has fantastic tools for loading CAD files and for loading Revit files, in fact, which Richard is gonna show you in quite a bit of detail so that fundamentally you can see in context details of the construction object um, as, as it's going through that process from the GIS and uh, link those two together. Go ahead, Richard. You can just, uh, well, maybe I should say a few preliminary remarks about GeoBIM. So GeoBIM is a project that we've been working on with Autodesk uh, for a while now. It started out as a sort of uh, just a demonstration of how this might be done, but it's, we've taken it quite a bit further so that there's real integration with uh, BIM 360 docs issues, uh, the views, sheet sets, so that, you know, when you have an object in the GIS, you can link it to the construction object or the, you know, 3D model on the Autodesk side. And you can do that actually with either a scene or with a 2D map. We're going to show 2D maps today. But that integration allows you to view issues, view other features of the uh, construction document, either a Revit file, could be a PDF could be a civil 3D drawing, right? This, this is not limited really to any specific kind of file type, but really to any document that you've got in your uh, BIM 360 docs system. And that allows you to see this data. And when you see the issues working together, it's really kind of neat because you can create issues here, see them in BIM 360 docs and start that whole collaborative workflow. Okay, here in my 3D model in RGIS Pro, uh, I'm navigating to the area where I want to place my georeference uh, Revit uh, design model. So here I navigate, I will put it in one, what exists a parking lot there, and just from the scene doing right click and add data, I just select the, the, the Revit model and that's it, you know, it's uploading automatically. You need to check because some sub layers are not on, so in this case I put them on. And then you can see, how it's rendered in the, in the 3D scene. 
in, in, in a very similar way as uh, Revit does it, you know, with all the details and everything that you need there. So what I would like to do this now with this uh, layer, Revit layer that just uh, upload is publish it to RGIS online. In this case, what I'm doing in this particular moment is changing the coordinate system to ensure that the base maps pass by through the publishing because uh, they need the uh, WGS83 coordinate system. When I have that, I do right click on the layer and select um, uh, publish sharing as a web layer. And then when the tool show up, I just fill all, uh, the information that it needs, you know, the tags and the uh, and the folder that where I want to place it in, in inside my RGIS online. And then with who in my organization I want to share it and just publish it. It will take uh, probably a couple minutes until it's done. But when it's done, you can go to RGIS and, and take a look and, and you will see the in that folder, the new layer is placed. You just click there. You see all the definition and metadata and clicking, you just open the scene where that layer is. And you will see that it's, nothing is, is lost during the conversion. Everything is there. It's, a, it's, it's pretty, pretty neat. So I click there and you see it's exactly the same type of uh, details that you see in RGIS Pro on, on, on Revit. So now what I'm doing is um, just uploading another layer, a 2D layer from that, that I have here, that is the footprint of the building. And just I, I want to change the style to 3D and, and do some extrude just to make it look more in 3D style, you know, in, in this scene. So I just define the, change the color and, and change the, the, the elevation. So it will be like, uh, yeah, a, a, a top, yeah. I mean, in the case of Kingston, they actually have done a superb job of creating uh, really good looking 3D model uh, buildings uh, anyway. So, but, you know, as an example, um, the ability to kind of have these 3D models, one, you know, in InfoWorks for the specific purposes of design. I do want to make that distinction, right? The whole point of using InfoWorks to get these 3D models built may not seem obvious. Well, there seems some overlap here. Um, that's not really the case because that level of 3D design that you're doing that is able to be exported to three, civil 3D and have the complete model in place with all of the different, um, you know, the components uh, and the libraries and so on, that is really an incredible time-saving uh, exercise. And on the other side of it with scenes and so on, you've got that ability to visualize. But what Richard's saying here is that the content is almost the same. It's a pretty much identical content that you're able to visualize now. There have been some changes, by the way, between 10.6 and 10.7 in the way the uh, Revit model loader works. Um, that, you know, for one of the uh, workshops we're going to be doing in the future, we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit of detail. Because if you've already done it, it changes things. Yeah, you can also publish that layer, the Revit layer, as a layer package. So if you have an existing scene, you can include it. So in this case, I, I, I go further. Now it's... And I have the Revit model in, in Doc360 in my project. So as you can see, and, and now what I will do is I create, I create an issue on the roof of the building. You know, for, for my reference, let's say that there's an issue on the roof, there's some lost material there that hasn't been cleaned. So I put it there, you know, and, and so it's part of my project and assign it to me in this case. So I create it. Now, you know, I see the I, I see that was created uh, right, it's number eight issue, and now I go to the GeoBin application. So where I have already a link, but th sorry, this is a GIS online where I can I wanted to show you the shape of the building that I have in the, my three D my two D map, but now I go back to the GeoBin application, and then having a link to this new shape of the building to that file to the red file that I have in dot three sixty. I can see it. I can see and uh, everything that is in 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 Doc 360, and 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 now you can see, and also I can see the issues that are assigned to that building. You know, I see the issue eight that I just create. All, all the properties of the issue, and now I want to create a new issue from here, in the third floor. So I said I saw some tools. You know, that also need to be big is safety. So I put. Uh, 
I define some properties there, you know, and then uh, when it's done, I save it. So this will be, uh, later you will see in the that is available also in Docs. So I create the issue. I, I check it again here. You will see now the new issue that show up. Also, you can you can go to the document browser, you know, and open different sheets. In this case, it's two D, and where you can also create issues here as well. You know, so you can navigate and and, and review that and jump from one to the other. Now I'm going back to the 3D. Yeah, and then you, as, as I mentioned before, you can use all the tools available from the viewer. And then I go back to Docs 360, and I open my, my file again in, in my model and check the issues. And then you will see that the new issue uh, was created and it's available for everybody working in this project. So you can see it from here or, or from yeah. the Gmin 360, you know? Yeah. Oh. So, I mean, you know, the, I mean, we compressed a lot of work into a very, very short period of time here, but I think you can see the promise of this. So you would have people who were really focused on the construction of a single building who would use that part of uh, BIM 360 to be tracking issues, to be assigning them, to be monitoring progress, and they'd be using the dashboard that uh, is sort of behind BIM 360 to track progress. But they might not be focused on, you know, the broad view of various construction projects that are underway uh, for the, you know, entire city or for a property owner or something like that. Whereas on the GIS side, you're now able to sort of visualize the whole landscape of your projects and link to the different BIN 360 documents that are underlying those so you can start to get a global view. And that's a, a project that is going to be evolving over the next few quarters here with Autodesk as we start to roll out some uh, beta customers um, that we're talking to now um, and hoping to do one per quarter for the next few quarters. So the key takeaways from what we've shown you here, and it is recorded, so if any of it was sort of uh, zipping by, it's all going to be available to review. But the connector is really a great tool. It's an incredible demonstration of the partnership between Esri and Autodesk. No more import-export of files. You only have to use the data you need. So one of the examples, we didn't show this, but imagery is one of the features that you can use here on an image server. Right now, um, you know, it has to be on an image server, but you can use imagery on an image server. And, you know, it, a lot of customers will have four gigabyte, 10 gigabyte Mr. Sid or ECW files that, you know, when you're doing an engineering project, you typically either have some process to extract from them or someone is giving you the file and you're extracting for your project on your own. Now, all you have to do is grab the data from a service. Not only that, but with Collector, you can update in the field, refresh in at InfoWorks, and actually see that change without having to, you know, disrupt the work you've been doing. Finally, though, you can actually update back. Right now, it's just geometry, but that's going to be evolving over time. So you really have a single source of data with ArcGIS Online or Portal. I want to make that really clear. This also works with, um, you know, on-premise Portal as well um, for that data to be uh, consolidated. Now, when you're doing this, you're pulling in your model data from ArcGIS, your building model, you're doing your preliminary design in InfoWorks, you want to do the detailing in Civil 3D, you can now do that through either the export of the point cloud or the IMX model. So there's ways to get that ArcGIS data into the Civil 3D environment. The other thing is ArcGIS Pro loads Revit models really well, does a beautiful job of them. And obviously CAD models too. There are ways in ArcGIS Pro to load various different kinds of CAD models that we can talk about uh, in some of our workshops. And then finally, the GeoBIM web integration allows operational views of this data, both the GIS side and the BIM side, so you can start visualizing uh, projects at a macro level from a performance perspective and uh, treating all this data as a kind of common source where there's no files being copied anywhere here. It's a really refreshing service-based architecture for making this integration possible. 
So I think that's it. We had a few questions. Oh, what's next? Sorry. Um, okay, so uh, get started using the tools. So the 2020 products from Autodesk are out. 10.7 from uh, Esri is out. These things work together. We showed you nothing that you can't do today with out-of-the-box tools, except for the GMM stuff, which you have to kind of go through Autodesk and us to kind of get going on because it's, uh, it's early days on that project. Um, we'll be at Esri UC and Autodesk University giving presentations and talking to people about how all this stuff works. And uh, we have a social media site, of course, and everything like that. So sign up and get uh, constant updates from us, more than you probably want. And please fill in the survey. Let us know what else you would like to know about how this works. And I did get quite a few questions that I'll probably go over for a few minutes. And if there are any more, please send them along. But uh, the survey helps us do a better job. Um, so, you know, do keep in touch and let us know what you're doing and uh, how we can help. Uh, let me see here. Okay. Oh, the answered, oh, there's my answered questions. They're in another little tab. So there was a question about um, fiber to the home, which was kind of neat. And actually, you know, with InfoWorks, if you got ArcGIS data in your back end, you could build a model for that um, to visualize, certainly, uh, you know, the telecom infrastructure. You need 3D symbols for all of it, but you can do that. And, you know, uh, under certain circumstances, you might be able to just do that in ArcGIS Pro for that particular use case as well. Depends really on the specific use case that you have. Um, from a scanning perspective, that's a really good one too, because you do, you know, for the point clouds, you need to have some kind of scanning, uh, you know, service. Either you're doing it yourself, flying your own drones, terrestrial devices, or the Cyclomedia offering, which is a driven sort of uh, Google Street View on steroids, I guess you could say. It's a, like incredibly high quality uh, panoramic imagery, superb performance. It's a hosted solution. And the LiDAR uh, point cloud quality is extremely dense. I mean, there, you know, the, it was about, that InfoWorks project you saw was about five or six gigabytes of uh, just, just, just the point clouds uh, for that small area. But the results of the profiles that you get are extremely accurate because the data is uh, kind of guaranteed to be within a few centimeters of uh, reality. And there was one other question that I want to talk to from Christine shaw Luke. Kapsky about um, white space uh, and landscape architecture, but I'd, I'd need to know more to better understand what, what's, what the use case is there. But uh, it was an excellent question about, uh, you know, white space in the design and uh, the mapping. Do I have any others? I might have a couple more ones. Um, GeoBIM, there's a question here, Stephen. GeoBIM available only in ArcGIS Online, or does it require ArcGIS Pro? Uh, GeoBIM is uh, totally web web based, so um, you can feed ArcGIS, you know, use ArcGIS Pro to feed your data to it. Um, but it's uh, either on premise or online, and we use a thing called Heroku, which is a sort of free hosting environment to serve a .NET Core infrastructure with just a little glue server that links the ArcGIS Online or on-premise portal to your BIM 360 account, essentially. That's what's happening there. So Pro would be used to build your scenes and your, um, you know, your 2D web maps. And uh, from there, you, you know, the links are made by the application. Mm hmm. It's a question about Toronto and side, you know, uh, Google Sidewalk Labs. And I just, I don't know. I know there are some people inside Autodesk. This came up at a conversation we had about smart cities, but um, I'd have to forward that to uh, get an answer on that one. Oh, yeah, there was a question about permissions, too. I guess one thing that someone was curious about is, um, well, there were two questions, really. Like, how how is the author authorization to make changes controlled and it's just controlled by your ArcGIS user account ID when you're logging into the uh, Autodesk connector for ArcGIS. So whatever permissions you have, you can use. And if you don't have them, you can't do it. So you can't do updates unless you're explicitly authorized to do so. And then tracking those changes is up to, you know, the designer of your database, whether it's versioned and whether you're tracking certain features of, uh, you know, like timestamps and so on. 
but you you know any it's it's purely if there's no magic it's literally calling arcgis rest apis to do the updates so whatever arcgis online or portal can do you can do with these updates i think that's about it i really appreciate your time and uh, we're really, you know, we love to get into conversations about this stuff. It's a lot of it's new. Um, a lot of it's really exciting just from a, you know, sort of shaving minutes or hours from every project. All of a sudden that starts to add up over, uh, you know, a year's worth of projects. So we're hoping that does this and we'd like to, you know, better understand how we can help you put this to use and prepare for it. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye-bye.